All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I know it's a little bit early, but uh, bear with me. I'm still dealing with a little bit of something that came from the plane, so my voice might not be everything that it could be today, but trust me, we've got good information. And while we may not have said it in the slide, what we're gonna talk about today uh, is mainly looking at SQL 2016 and how the server platform starts to play into SQL's new design tenants in terms of you know, um, being a big data capable database and basically mission critical on all the fronts as well as you know, the types of performance you can go do for real analytics. So just a raise of hands, how many of you are seriously looking at SQL 2016 or there's one, two, okay, perfect. And so I don't know if you've decided upon a server platform or some of the tenants and, and things that you should consider as you take a look at you know, uh, SQL 2016, but this is uh, ideally um, a session that you'll get an idea of, at least from our perspective, where we went and did some testing and things like that, that you know, it starts to play in. So I'll introduce myself. I'm John Hettenhouse. I'm a director at uh, Dell EMC in product management. Specifically, one of the key activities that my team does, uh, we do technical marketing. And technical marketing means we take a look at our platforms and the solutions that run on top of them, okay? And so SQL 2016 being one of those, and we go out to do third-party testing. And then we also look at competitive testing. And so as you might expect, you know, with Dell EMC acquisition now complete, we're looking at all the back-end storage elements as well. So we're really getting more and more focused on end-to-end -end solutions, which, you know, at the time we started doing this testing, we used Compellent as, as one of our backends, but now we're looking at Extreme IO and some of the other things. So, and I've got key members of my team sitting in the back that helped do the presentation. You've got Emmanuel Casamo and Bud Cock, um, both of them key members that uh, really helped bring all this together. So really appreciate you all taking the time. So what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the trends in the big data and database market that are playing out. We also wanna do a, an overview of SQL 2016. I don't know, have any of you been to sessions on SQL 2016 just yet? If not, okay, one. So we'll do an overview on that and look at some of the attributes of SQL 2016, right? And then we'll take a look at System Center because it's very important. Systems management plays out driving efficiencies and automation and simplification. So a lot of the TCO, once you deploy a server, starts to factor in, and having integration into Microsoft System Center is absolutely essential. We'll also take a look at Dell's EMC server portfolio for Microsoft SQL. So that's mainly going to be our four socket servers, right, or four CPUs in the server, and we've got some examples in the back of the room that, you know, feel free to take a look after the presentation. And then, you know, we'll take a look at some of the benchmarks my team drove around uh, SQL 2016 along with SAP 9.4, which is another, you know, kind of big data analytics uh, software. And then, of course, we also had SAP HANA. And then we'll have a demo uh, by one of our esteemed colleagues from Broadcom, Mark Jones. And then we'll have the results and we'll close out with Q&A. So that's kind of the road trip as we go through this presentation. And if we take a look, data is really the new electricity, right? It's a commodity. You know, I tend to be a pack rat, right? So when I take pictures on vacations, it used to be I used film, right? And you had 36 exposures, but now you have a digital camera. So hell, now you'll take 100, right? And what do you do with all that stuff? You keep it. And so, you know, one of the things that's starting to happen is, we're, you know, data just keeps, you know, getting absorbed. And businesses aren't getting rid of that data, right? Because now you've got cold storage, you've got hot storage, and then you've got all flash array storage. And it's just, you know, how do I get the data to a level that I can start to get to the server to get it worked? And so what we're going to start to see, if you haven't already, is server-centric computing is really important, right? So. What you'll start to see is one of our design tenants at Dell is driving more local storage into the server itself, right? More memory so that I can get bigger data sets into that memory, also have the drive storage next to it, right? And so the, the drive storage next to it, you know, I, it can be traditional spindle, it can be SAS SSD, SATA SSD, NVMe. The whole idea is the faster the storage, the more memory, the faster I can put things into the CPU to get them processed. And you know, if we take a look at how big data is starting to change things, if we look at EIU, they did a study, and they looked at some of the businesses that are out there. And if you think about it, if you look at the new industries, and that 43%, you start thinking of the Ubers, the Netflix, 
those businesses that didn't exist like 10 years ago. And what happened is they started building infrastructure very rapidly. You know, you got a, you know, one of the largest taxi cab companies in the world that doesn't own a single taxi cab, Airbnb. And so it's really important when you take a look at how these businesses came about purely by driving application driven, you know, industries. And if we take a look of those surveyed, you know, are you really making money using big data in your business, right? And if we take a look, 58% in North America that were surveyed said, yes, we are, 56%, 63% for uh, Asia. So companies are starting to figure out how to try to data mine and aggregate those disparate storage silos and to be able to visualize that data the way, the way that they need to to try and make business decisions. And if we take a look at um, IC, a technology research company, they came back and they expect a 23% annual, or should, a 23% compounding annual growth rate going to 2019, which is gonna net out to be about a $50 billion business. The other thing to consider, just as kind of a side note, you know, there are over 3 million mobile applications on whether it's iTunes or Apple, and you know, if I take a look at Google, and it's only going to compound at a rate that increases so that the applications are going to exceed capacity according, according to Gartner by 5x. So if you take a look at the amount of data, how the mobility pieces are starting to factor in, and you know, kind of this real time, on the spot, I want my information when and where I want it, right? It's super important to consider those things. So if we take a little bit about the landscape of the database, right? So on the left-hand side here, what we have are some of the business attributes, right? So 48% of the organization, you know, are out there saying in the next 12 to 18 months, I'm absolutely consider doing something around business intelligence and analytics. 67%, no surprise here, right? IT budgets have remained relatively flat to increasing single digit, right? I'm sure, show of hands, have your IT budgets gone up dramatically in the last three to five years? Probably not. Um, and so when we talked about that TCO element, super important, right? Because when you're making a capital expenditure decision, right, I've got to figure out, do I need to provision a data center for the next three to five years using traditional rack and tower? Do I need to start thinking about modular, right? Where I pay as I go. And I continue to add compute resources, not in a three to five year cycle, but on an annual cycle as needed. So lots of things to think about in terms of when you look at those capital expenditures and how does modular play in like a, you know, um, combining, you know, compute storage and networking into a singular platform. And then of course, you know, the other 39% that were surveyed said, you know, application performance is absolutely a growing issue within their organization. And so when we start taking a look at on-time, real-time kind of analytics, right, it's really important because, for example, if you take a look at somebody on an online store, you know, or they have their mobility app, there's about a 250 microsecond response time that's required before they go ahead and say, you know what, enough, I'm gone, done, not going to happen. And so having the ability to really serve up the content to that individual is critical. There's also greater adoption of in-memory technologies, right? Because getting those data sets closer to the compute's really important, but we all know that memory is really expensive, right? It's an expensive option when you take a look at traditional drives locally into the server itself. And, you know, ongoing focus on security, no surprise. How do you lock down that server locally? So if I'm using secure encrypted drives, if I make sure that my service port for my systems management is locked down, that they can't come in on a separate line, super important to make sure that all those attributes of security are covered. And then, you know, the other piece that's really important is no size fits all, right? So being able to aggregate disparate databases and being able to visualize that data in a way that you can go and drive business value is key here. So in terms of SQL, no SQL, big data, those things are um, a part of you know, what's key. So if we go in and take a little bit of a look at the need for big data and analytics, you know, you've got to have scalable performance. And so does it always have to be a four socket server? Maybe, it depends the type of performance and scale that you need. TCO savings, how do I buy it so that I can scale that application? Because with certainty, you know, there's more than likely going to be the need to to take care of more and more users over time 
to address bigger data sets as the data volumes grow. It's gotta be mission critical, right? Because if you're looking at online transaction processing and you've got you know, Cyber Monday, you can't afford to have your storefront go down and you know, deal with you know, not being able to uh, fill orders. And that's workload optimization. optimization. This starts to get to the point that we were talking about a little bit, which is how do I get the right compute resources? Do I do it a modular way, or do I look to do that in a data center three to five year type of horizon? And I keep building out with traditional racks in my data center. And so if we take a look a little bit more at, you know, kind of, you know, where is SQL today with all of this, in, you know, built in. So memory is super important. So for example, on the R930 in the back of the room, what you'll find out is there's 96 DIMMs in that, which can equate up to 12 terabytes worth of data that can be in memory within that server itself. And so being able to address not just one database, but two databases, and this starts to play out this story a little better. So in this particular case, we've got an online transaction processing action taking place, and we're trying to do fraud detection. And so in a traditional model, what you might do is you'd use ETL to basically create a job that would go to the, look at the data warehouse. The data warehouse would create a report that would come back and say, you know, hey, I don't see any fraud detection, or perhaps I do. That can take between two to 24 hours to try to do. And you can't have that with fraud detection. If you take a, let me um, build this out. If we take a look, oops making sure that's built out. If we take a look at, I actually, yeah, this one. Let it build out. With in-memory compute store, I can have both of those engines, my data warehouse, along with my OLTP database, both running in memory. And basically, what that does is by running both of those in memory, my OLTP isn't gonna suffer a hit on performance and I'm gonna get up to 30% faster transactions on that fraud detection, and in some cases, they've seen over almost 100, per, 100 times faster. Queries go from, you know, it could be from hours to minutes to seconds, and then you can also get really to this point of real-time analytics, right? And so, really important, I mean, there's a number of things my team has done being engaged with, you know, kind of the, fraud detection that's out there, the ISVs that are out there now, the um, software vendors. And you know they want servers that are just jammed full of memory and NVMe drives to try to get to these, you know, being able to do millions of transactions within um, their operation model to be able to detect fraud. So if we take a look at the advanced analytics piece with uh, SQL services, um, the server R services, you know, this is all about bringing the databases together. So if I take a look at this and I can do my mission critical OLTP, I can do high performance data warehouse, all of those are separate, but at the same time can all be visualized, right? And extracted from by using R built into your T-SQL. And then of course I get these real time operational analytics and I can operate at a massive scale. And if we take a look at SQL you know, 2016, it's about leadership in this category over time. And now they're actually upping the ante by going more into memory that's delivering even higher thresholds of performance for mission critical types of applications, right? And so we go from left to right, you know, I might be a little bit hard to see, but in the very upper right hand corner is where Microsoft is, and that's followed by Oracle, right? So they're an industry leader in terms of you know, their database and delivering, you know, I guess, you know, key design tenants for customers. They're the most secure database, right? If we take a look you know, over the last six years, you know, um, without a doubt, Oracle has been struggling, and so there's a big difference there. High performance data warehouse, they have more performance. They're number one versus the other database offerings that are there. They're also, I think, equally important as we talked about the TCO piece, which is a fraction of the cost, right? So if I take a look at licensing all in, and we'll look at the next slide that kind of goes into the TCO a little bit more in depth, but you can see I can get down to $120 per user, and in that particular scenario, it, Tableau would cost me you know, a little bit more at 480, and then at Oracle, because of their pricing model, or I should say licensing pricing model, you know, what you're gonna start to see is increase because 
you know, they want you to keep buying, you know, additional capabilities based upon your core count. And then, of course, you know, the in-database analytics, you know, having in-memory along with um, the, our services is super important in terms of being able to generate scale. So let's take a look at the industry-leading TCOPs. So the fine print down here is really important. If we take a look, it's an OLTP data warehouse where we've got a two-processor system with eight cores per processor. And so what we did is we built this out and we said, you know, in Microsoft, SQL 2016, all of the in-memory, end-to-end security, advanced analytics, the uh, complete mobile business intelli or, um, intelligence, um, basically, all of those things are included in your licensing. If I look at SQL, you know, I buy my OLTP, but then Data Warehouse is another licensing um, opportunity. Business Intelligence, another licensing opportunity. And these are, you know, basically paying out, you know, at $10,000 a core. And so that's how you start to get into an annualized run rate of about $2.2 million in terms of the Oracle cost and, you know, 648000 on the SQL 2016 piece. So there's an extreme value in terms of looking at the licensing model between Oracle versus SQL, you know, where you can see, you know, the annualized rate is 3.4x and the cost per user is about 20x. So Oracle, very expensive, while everything is built into SQL. Now, if we take a little bit of a look, so one of the things that Dell EMC does is we build validated architectures because not everybody has the resources within their business to basically go out and try to identify and size, you know, what is the solution for my business? And so we have validated architectures around, you know, a small database upgrade that would be, you know, like an R430. And an R430 is a two socket, you know, system, one U, relatively small. Um, can handle, you know, an adequate size database for a very, you know, I would call it a small business, right? Where I could run some virtualized machines and things. Then I start to look at the R730XD. I start to step up because now I'm driving more local storage in that server. So the R730XD, for example, can have up to 26 drives in it, okay? And so now I can bring those data sets. It can be all, it can be flash and it can also be a mix of NVMe. So now I've stepped up my performance, right, in terms of being able to scale my application performance on the R730XD tied into my compellent SE4020. When I start to look at the medium to large, this is where we start to look at the four socket systems, right? If we take a look at the R830, that's the value, price, I'd say price to performance type of play. So it's a 2U four socket server um, that depending upon what you're looking to do, delivers great performance, right? I can still support NVMEs, I still support drives and all that. When I'm starting to look at mission critical, that's where the R930 starts to factor in, right? And what, like we talked about, the number of DIMMs that it has, the number of drives that it has, the PCIe slots, you know, to the extent that you're, you're over, I guess, you know, subscribed on all of the available memory, it allows you to do more memory mirroring and things like that, right? different RAID setups on the local server drives themselves to protect your data, right? In terms of also, you know, being able to hot, you know, all the hot plug capabilities and things that you might need. And as a part of all of these systems, one of the things to think about is, depending upon resource again, is, well, how do I know what my SQL, you know, database might be doing today? Well, that's where the implementation services start to factor in. We can come out, our services team, and actually take a look at, you know, what's the, what's the health state of your SQL performance in your business today? Look at the data migration and backup services that you might have in play. And then, you know, we can also do a full-on deployment service within the business. And then post-implementation, it's all about call support, break fix. You know, something breaks, we show up, we fix it. And then, of course, it's having hardware and software support to be able to triage and remediate the issues that you might encounter. So end-to-end -end solutions, and so like I said, these are validated, you'll know what the performance is, and it's very simple, right, to go in and say, you know, I don't have the resources, but I need something that performs like X. These are the types of solutions that can do that. It's a time to value type of opportunity. So now we talked a little bit about open manage at the, or I should say systems management at the opening. And it, it really is critical that if you take a look at the manager of managers that you have within your business, right, 
because you've got, usually you've got the hardware level, but then you've got something up above that's looking at your net, your, um, you know, kind of the manager of managers that's looking at what's the state of health of the network, what's the state of the health of storage, et cetera, et cetera. And being able to be integrated is really important, right? Because the last thing you want to do is propagate more management consoles into your environment. So now it takes more resources to try to figure out when something's not working the way that it should. And so with uh, Open Manage, what we have is the Open Manage integration suite for Microsoft System Center. And it really is the ability to take a look at and see the state of the health of Dell hardware with the System Center console. That's the key piece here. And then over to the right-hand side, what you'll see is some of the things that we talked about in terms of generating the TCO. And we'll talk about m some more of these in depth, but it really is about how do I deliver faster you know, setup time on a Hyper-V-based system? And what we did is, of course, went, like I told you, did all third-party studies. So all these are uh, included in the presentation. So I'm assuming that all attendees will be able to, if you want to go and actually see the study, they're all available you know, fewer tools and interfaces, right? So what we want to do is much consolidation and simplification as we can. And so that's really what systems management is about in delivering TCO, right? It's about delivering better automation so that your resources can have more things to do in more important areas. And then it's, you know, how do I deliver, you know, auto, you know not just automation, but simplicity, right? Less interfaces, less steps. So if I go up to a server and I want to take a look at it and check, you know, do I have to use a crash cart? Can I use my iPhone or my Android phone? Whatever it is. And that's the capabilities that are built into Dell servers. So that's what's driving some of these, you know, I don't, ha I, I, I don't have to walk the row and take a look at the amber and green lights, right, in the data center. So kind of talking a little bit more about the integration with System Center, right? The secret or I should say the common theme within Dell is the Dell Lifecycle Controller integration in and of itself. So Dell was the first one to bring this to market, right? We put the Lifecycle Controller into our systems along with iDRAC, and it's become a really important piece of our management strategy. Took us from being an also ran to a leader in systems management in our platforms. And so what we also, what we have from a deployment perspective, just looking across the lifecycle, you know, if I take a look, I want to deploy something. I have two options. My first one is I can do it agent free, right? Which is no agents need to be installed. So one less thing to have to manage simplification in my environment. And what I can do is a bare metal deployment of my, of my OS and other things onto my server, okay? The second piece is I can also do that with an agent, right? And be able to go and use the deployment pack to go do that. If I want to update, part of what I can do here is this is about BIOS and firmware. I can also do that agent-free and with an agent. From an agent-free perspective, working with uh, the configuration manager, what I'm able to do is create, you know, basically update procedures that allow me to go and make sure that nothing happens to a server that I didn't want to have happen. And if I take a look at, you know, when I do it with an agent, while I can still go and update BIOS and firmware, but you know, the thing of it is is that you know, I have to go and have that server up and running to be able to go do that. When I take a look at monitoring, a little bit different. You know, once again, I can do it with an agent or I can do it agent-free. With an agent, or I should say agent-free, keeping with the right uh, steps here, when I do it agent-free, what, what happens here is I can also get the inventory of that server along with you know, figuring out you know, what's the status of the system, what's the state of health, et cetera. And without the agent, you know, I'm pretty much confined to the server itself. When I do include an agent, you know, I can absolutely manage those attributes again, but then I also get some other things within Dell, right? Now I start to tie in my compellent storage. I can also tie in my clients, so think about the Optiplex, Latitude, Precision Workstations, and so across the storage and everything. So with an agent, I get a little broader suite. When I start taking a look at Virtual Machine Manager, and sorry, I'm gonna take a quick drink of water real quick. I can use a Dell Server Pro Pack. And so basically, this, isn't going to, this will be agent-based. And what the Dell Server Pro Pack is, is it basically allows you to manage the 
resources of that host system and the virtual machine. So I can do remediation if I need to. And the second thing is that I can also manage the resources that are assigned to those virtual machines that they may need more memory, something you know to make sure that they're getting the right performance factors. Okay, so if we also take a look at, you know, kind of tying this back a little bit, we saw some of the operational things earlier. And if we take a look at the CIO dilemma, right, they've got to deliver operational efficiency, common axioms, flexibility at any scale, and worry-free computing. And so one of the things we did is we said, okay, my team went out and we did some of the third-party testing. So I can reduce firmware updating by 92% with iDRAC and repository manager. So imagine if I had a server um, up on the network, a file server, and basically I could have iDRAC with repository manager go out and take a look at all those servers and come back and tell me which ones don't have the right firmware in place. Because what you don't want in your environment is image drift, right? Image drift is a bad thing because that opens you up to security issues and you're, you know, you, it only continues, right? Because somebody may do something to a server, may not finish it, and does it, you know, where do they pick it up and keep it going? So what we did is we saw 92% there. 99% reduction in configuration time with Dell Zero Touch. So what this one is, is specifically, once again, think about a file server up on the network. What I can do is I have XML files that basically say what I want the server to be. And what I can say is I want this XML file to go to this server or this group of servers and whatever. So basically, you know, our favorite saying is rack stack, walk, walk away, and then basically use, you know, um, Dell Zero Touch to basically go and, and configure your servers for you. The other thing to think about is, you know, um, what we saw from a Cisco solution that we wanted to talk about is they have a whole lot of problems with east to west migration. So when you're looking at a, you know, basically a VMware live migration, what we saw is, you know, we could be 28% faster than they could so if you're looking to rebuild a system very quickly and to get those VMs migrated, we saw a 28% improvement factor. So let's take a look real quick at the server portfolio. So there's basically two key elements within our server portfolio. Traditional rack and tower, and then some of the more interesting things that we talked about, this server-centric compute and the modular space. And so, you know, the traditional rack and tower I'm sure everybody's familiar with. When we start taking a look at the more modular pieces, right, if I look at Vertex, FX, those two systems in particular have shared storage within their chassis, along with networking. Vertex is more in a tower form factor, so it was targeted for remote office branch office op applications um, to provide the redundancy and things for like a retail store. Imagine all the targets that are out there, and they need a back end you know, kind of system operating. This one has, the only thing it doesn't have is a redundant switch. Um, otherwise, everything else in the system is redundant to keep that store up and running, for example. FX is the latest addition to that modular family. And FX2 is, what we wanted to do is shake up what a traditional rack is, right? And it's all about how do I start to optimize that compute? And you heard me talk about the pay as you go. That's what FX2 is about. So if I have an application and I need to add more storage, you know, there are storage sleds and compute sleds along with network aggregation and switch within the chassis as well that allow me to basically tune the compute resources um, on the fly. And it also provides easy scalability. The traditional blade in infrastructure, that's the PowerEdge M, so I think everybody knows about blades. PowerEdge C is, you know, that's really about high performance compute, um, also once again very modular. And then we've got the extreme scale infrastructures where you come in with modular buildings with uh, racks and racks of servers within them. So that's our portfolio. And then if we take a little bit more look at the four socket offerings, um, some of the things I really like, you know, you heard me talk a lot about the R930, which is absolutely our most robust offering for uh, database and, you know, business critical types of applications. The R830, a little bit of a sweeter price point, but, you know, adequate performance. The FC830 is something I really like. Um, I'll call it out a little bit specifically. And when I think of SQL 2016 and I think about always on, oops, I don't know why I did that. And I think about SQL always on. Imagine if you could run redundant 
um, or I should say failover in a 2U chassis. So basically FX2, the chassis itself, could have two FC830s running in parallel, okay? Now think about the opportunity here. I, to do that on the R930, I'd have to have 8U. In this particular case, I can do it in 2U and you know, have all the performance that I need. The other thing you'll see in the picture is one of the things, I don't it must have a timing to the next slide, sorry guys. Um, we also drove a 1.8 inch SATA SSD form factor for local drives in this chassis. So there is a lot of flash within the compute node itself. The other one is the M830, once again, blade, four socket, um, you know, for the ultimate density uh, play within our four socket portfolio. Now, if we look a little bit at Intel Xeon, super important in terms of you know, what it delivers to our platforms. So if we take a look at the E7, the amount of memory that it gives you, the amount of cores that it gives you, I mean, just unprecedented performance. You know, it goes up to 24 terabytes. You heard me in the R930, we can go to 12. Um, and so, you know, basically, and just a tremendous amount of resource in a 4U uh, platform. And then, you know, obviously, you know, some of the turbo behavior and other things that are there. The next slide is fairly similar to the one we just went to. Um, I like this one in terms of there's a little bit more here about reliability and the runshore technology that Intel has within their CPU stack and the E7. And then it's the enhanced security pieces that are there. So on this one, you heard me talk a little bit about what we did around four socket. So on the SAS 9.4, what we found out is we could drive 17x better performance using SAS 9.4 on 12 VMs. And so this was a big server consolidation play that they wanted us to help tell the story about. For SQL 2016, we also saw tremendous results you know, in the four socket studies that we did when we were preparing for launch. So a lot of the system resources that we saw you know, were really uh, important. And you know, I think part of the things to think about here too, you know, what we factored into our testing is also thinking about software caching, right? I can either cache locally at the server, I've got something called SanDisk DAS cache. So that data to which is really hot that I can't all keep in memory, but I, you know, I wanna keep on a really fast drive like an NVMe or at least an SSD, you know, and, and keep it queued up so that it's right there when the memory can take it into the CPU. It's all about the hot data, once again, being cached on a higher performance uh, local media in the server. And then, of course, there's also uh, SAN caching. So depending upon if you already have an all-flash array, you can also look at getting further acceleration attributes um, out of a uh, software uh, SAN caching offering. Okay. And so this is just a little bit about our relationship with Microsoft, you know, in terms of we've been in partnership for over 30 years, ever since Michael started the company. They've been a big part of our success, and ideally it's a reciprocal relationship from that perspective. And then, you know, we've done the supported platform technology. We've got the integrated server management that we talked about with Microsoft System Center. And, you know, Dell PowerEdge is the nitro fuel. So depending upon which platform you're looking at, you can get as much nitro as you want. And I think what's really important is a lot of development work, you know, goes into it. I started off at Dell doing Windows Server 2008, and the amount of collaboration that we did just around the operating system at Dell, um, it started two years in advance. So there's a lot of work that goes on between our organization that goes unseen. In terms of, you know, what's future ready, you know, we've already been working, you know, what features and attributes that are in, you know, Windows Server 2016 that we can include to optimize in our servers. So we absolutely talk about our platforms and share information and roadmaps to make sure when we come to market, we have a cohesive story together that adds, you know, value to our customers. Windows Server security and, you know, the use of TPM 2.0, that's important depending uh, upon, you know, how much you want to use a TPM, trusted platform module. Storage space is direct. Um, storage spaces is becoming, you know, more mature as it goes out with each iteration of the operating system. And so that's one of the things you heard me talk about from the, 
you know, driving more local server storage that to enable you to take advantage of, you know, um, storage spaces. And then, you know, performance and capacity, the optimum rolling cluster upgrades, those pieces are there. And, of course, Dell out-of-band management. That's what we were talking about when we were talking about agent-free, right? Because I don't have agents, I don't have to have an operating system, you know, up and running to be able to go and take a look at what that state of, our, the, the state of the device, and I can also gather the inventory on it. All right, now it's demo time. I'm, you, I'm gonna take the rest of my water. I'm gonna turn it over to one of our good partners, Mark Jones from Broadcom. So he helped us with the SQL 2016. There was a big inflection um, that we saw that, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to do SQL 2016 with uh, our compellent storage with an all flash array because we firmly saw that if you take a look at an all flash array on the back end, that fiber channel 16, because it's just gone through a generational update, was really important. So Mark, come on up, Greg. Let me go ahead. Thank you very much, John. Drink some water. <laughs> Did a great job, thank you. Do you need to be switched over? Uh, I'm okay, I'll switch it over. Okay. I'll take care of it, thanks. Here's for your slides. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, folks, thank you. Um, yeah, again, my name's Mark Jones. I work for Broadcom Limited. Uh, let me ask a question. Before I describe where I work in Broadcom Limited, how many folks here have a fiber channel SAN in their environment? So good, good number of you. A lot of people that use databases have fiber channel in the back end. Uh, I work for a division of uh, Broadcom Limited that's called the Emulex Group, the Emulex Connectivity Division. You may remember Emulex for making fiber channel adapter cards for the last, since the beginning of fiber channel, basically. Well, uh, what happened was Avago uh, Corporation bought, purchased Emulex last year, and then earlier this year, Avago purchased Broadcom Corporation. So together, we make up uh, uh, Broadcom Limited now. And so Emulex, the Emulex adapter cards and that branding all now remain inside of uh, Broadcom Limited. So, okay, so what we're gonna talk about now is, um, is how Gen 6 Fiber Channel uh, helps accelerate uh, uh, Windows Server, server uh, Windows um, SQL Server 2016, uh, especially with data warehousing applications. And so uh, what's really the catalyst for this is, John talked about how fast and capable the, the new Dell servers are, and that's absolutely true. Uh, but what's also happening on the other side is on the storage side, storage arrays have increased in performance dramatically. With all flash array technologies, uh, the, the capabilities now for even small storage arrays are extremely high as far as IOPS and, and throughput and bandwidth and, and latency and, uh, as well. So it's no, it's no uh, wonder then why all flash arrays, the market for this, are, are, is accelerating at a tremendous rate. And there's some statistics from IDC showing how uh, the growth of all flash arrays is just booming at a, at a fantastic rate. And one of the other things to think about with, with all flash arrays is that almost universally they're connected with fiber channel. There's only a few makers of all flash arrays that are, that are startup companies that uh, have yet to move, to, move to, to include fiber channel as part of their uh, solution portfolio. So together with the, the fast servers and the all flash array, we have this situation where the, the total compute model now is a little bit, uh, it's an equilibrium. No longer are the servers faster and the storage is slow or, or, or the other way around, but now we're, we have two very powerful pieces on either end of the data center. And so now the wire that connects all the stuff together that runs the, where the storage travels over the fiber channel network in the SAN is now possibly the bottleneck uh, for some applications. So together with Dell, we uh, conducted a benchmark using SQL Server 2016 earlier this year, and uh, we compared the performance difference of SQL Server 2016 in a data, in a data warehousing environment and, and showed the difference in performance when switching between earlier generations of fiber channel and the newer Gen 6 fiber channel. And so what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about that uh, this slide here shows the, the work we did together with Dell. Uh, it resulted in a DMARTEC white paper, which you can find on DMARTEC's website uh, that talks about this. And we used a, uh, a Dell uh, PowerEdge R930 server. So a big four-way server, it had uh, 96 cores in it, so it's super powerful. 
Uh, and then we had compellent storage, SC9000, all flash array storage. And in between was Brocade's new G Gen 6 uh, G620 switch, which is 32 gig fiber channel capable. And then uh, we ran a data warehousing application on SQL Server 2016, and we compared the performance between the L our LPE 12,000 HPA, which is 8 gig fiber channel, uh, then to 16 gig, which is the LPE 31,000, the new card that, that Dell carries, which is 16 gig fiber channel, but capable of running at 32 gig with a simple upgrade of optics. And then finally, the LPE 32,000 HPA, which is, uh, is a, a 32 gig fiber channel HPA with, with the optics in place. And we saw some tremendous performance improvements. So let me switch the screens, and I will try to give you a live demo. You know how live demos go. Oh, I didn't uh, log in. Hopefully you can't see my password. If you can, there's nothing really good, anything good there. Oh, and the VPN service. So sorry, guys. Well, that's probably not going to work. So let me, um, I have some screenshots that are probably are, are best going to uh, explain what happens. Um, as far as the configuration goes, uh, we're looking at Brocade's fabric management tool called uh, Network Advisor. And in our configuration, as I mentioned, we have a Dell R930 server. Uh, it's in the, the box on the right-hand side, the, the yellow box. Uh, and within that server, we have three HBAs, the LPE 12,000, the LPE uh, 31,000, and 32,000. So eight, 16, 32 gig fiber channel. And we have uh, two different uh, arrays. We have the compellent SC9000 that we used in the uh, DeMartech uh, SQL server test. And then we brought in a new array, uh, the Extreme IO uh, array. So they're both all flash arrays. Um, the eight gig fiber channel is configured to the Extreme IO. The 32 gig fiber channel is configured to the uh, compellent arrays. And this chart here, you can see the traffic flows uh, while the database test is running. So let me describe a little bit more about the test. So the, uh, what we configured was a TPCH workload on each of the databases. So we, have, we created one TPH, TPCH workload, replicated the, the database, and then we use a test called HammerDB. HammerDB runs a TPH, TPCH uh, data warehousing profile. We ran these both at the same time, and you can see how the traffic uh, moves around the different elements of the SAN. Uh, the high-speed traffic in red means that the link is completely saturated going to the HBAs. Uh, on the back end, the compellent array has just two active ports, and they're saturated in red. And then uh, the extreme I.O. array uh, has eight ports running at uh, eight gig fiber channel, and they're not quite saturated because you have so many ports. So, um, and again, on the server end, we have a single path. So that path is fully saturated. On the back end, we have multiple paths. So we're using MPIO to, to help round robin distribute the IO load across all the resources of the different arrays. Okay, here's a look at the I.O. taking place on the compellent array. Uh, you can see that each of the target ports of the compellent array are, are, are heavily utilized uh, during, the, during the benchmark, uh, but not overutilized. So we're able to take, uh, take advantage of all the performance across those uh, storage targets. And then on the extreme I.O. array, we're actually performing, it's, it's very difficult to see the actual number uh, from your seats, I'm sure, but it, the, each of the ports is actually performing about 100 megabytes per second. So uh, of all eight ports, we're, so we're doing very close to eight gig fiber channel line rate. And then this is a performance monitor uh, capture from Windows uh, Server looking at each of the physical disk devices uh, to see from between the HBA and the switch to see how utilized they are. And what you can see from this view is when both tests started, the TPCH test started, that immediately the I.O. for the 32 gig fiber channel went straight to line rate almost 100% of the time. And you can see it running there at 3,200 megabytes per second. While the, the 8 gig uh, link is running near its line rate around 700 megabytes per second. The other thing to note is you'll notice that the, the 32 gig, the yellow line, completed 
much sooner, so it ran I.O. and finished. So the actual TPCH query is completed because they ran so much faster at higher bandwidth. Okay, um, so again, the results of this, uh, as you can see from this example, the, the demo that I tried to show, is that in that example, the 8 gig fiber channel link is the bottleneck. Purely having faster fiber channel links in this kind of configuration with fast servers and fast storage, uh, it really helps accelerate the capabilities of SQL Server 2016. We can see that the completion time to run the TPCH workload uh, for 16 fi gig fiber channel is uh, about half as fast as 32 gig, and 32 gig fiber channel runs in about a quarter of the time. So here's a little more data, and you can find this data on the DeMartech uh, uh, paper that I mentioned on, on their website uh, that, for that third-party validation. But uh, again, here are the three tests run and the data overlaid over each other. The access on the left is uh, throughput, so how, how much data throughput is going into uh, the adapters, and the bottom access uh, is time. So the time it takes to complete all 22 queries of the TPCH test. So you can see that the TPCH test for 32 gig fiber channel, again, completes in a much shorter time, and it's because of the higher throughput. 16 gig, much shorter time than 8 gig, and again, because of higher throughput than, than 8 gig. And uh, so you can see there's a significant advantage to uh, having fast links uh, in your fiber channel SAN. And one last uh, view here is of what happens during the 22 queries. So each, each of the queries, uh, you can see here, they're all listed here, each, each of those complete in a much faster period of time because of the, of the faster SAN connectivity. Um, and you can see it's very similar to uh, the previous chart in which uh, in aggregate they, they finish in, in a very significantly uh, faster amount of time. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, Dell R930 servers offer tremendous performance. Uh, in our example, I tried to show they, run, they can easily run two TPCH uh, queries, tests at the same time. Uh, all flash array storage offers uh, tremendous storage capabilities, and you need a faster fiber channel link like Gen 5 or Gen 6 fiber channel to take full advantage of all those hardware resources. So. Uh, Thank you very much. And I, I think, John, you'll have a few final words, correct? All right. I think everybody thought they got rid of me. Thanks for the first <laughs> clap. I appreciate it. I'm back. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me switch us over here again. All right. Let me, ah, there it is. Sorry about that. That's my sport code. So, in summary, you've all been very patient and I appreciate it. So, you know, part of it is, is taking a look at SQL 2005. It's reached end of support life. SQL 2016 is a great opportunity to consider as an upgrade. And a lot of you had shown your hands. You know, are your databases as old as your infrastructure? We know that customers are holding on to infrastructure longer. You know, now we're at like five to six years in terms of, you know, the server purchase cycle. And so, you know, there's a lot of things. It's a great time to take a, think about new database, new hardware in terms of being able to uh, be able to provide the scale that you need within your organization. So, sorry everybody, I'm just, for some reason, I'm gonna have to, it doesn't look like it's transmitting to that screen. So, let me page up one more. Okay. So if you haven't done it already, the new Dell EMC booth is here. It's number 801, and I would encourage all of you to go you know, talk to our folks that are there. We've got members of our solutions team that are there that are, you know, we talked about the validated architecture, so those uh, folks are there. 
And you know, if you have more questions about SQL 2016 and what Dell's doing on our platforms, they can talk about that as well. And then of course, you know, I'd open it up to anybody who has any questions that our team can help address. If you want to talk about hardware, you know, I like hardware. <laughs> if you want to talk about software, we can talk about the things that we've done more in detail on SQL 2016, or in any case, anything that we presented today. So anybody have any questions? Sir. So the validated configurations that we have, I don't know if they're fast track or not to be off the top of my head. I'll ask my colleagues in the back. That may be an answer that we have to get for you. But I'm, I'm familiar with the program. I don't know if we're there yet. Because SQL 2016 is, rel I mean, it's still relatively new from a fast track availability type of perspective at this point. And I think, you know, I, I would also say a lot of it will be the back-end storage pieces that we need to work through now that we've gone through the merger to kind of round out that portfolio. Other questions? And I'll absolutely take your business card if you have one, or I'll take a picture of your uh, ID, and I'll get back to you. Other questions by anybody? How many users in here of Dell Gear? Dell EMC Gear. All right, I like the hands. Good man. <laughs> Partners don't count. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm I was just trying to get a reference. Anybody considering Dell? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Thank you for your time. Um, I also want to, Tammy, you know, mentioned that there is a party. I think she gave out the invites to everybody. We'd absolutely welcome you to come join us. Happy hour starts at 6 p.m. at the football, College Football Hall of Fame. There'll be some players there um, signing autographs and things like that. So you have the little football from Dell EMC, so that's one opportunity to get you know, a, a Hall of Famer uh, from college to sign it. Um, last piece, once again, go talk to our folks in booth 801. And with that, if there's no other questions, I'll let you guys uh, get on with the rest of your Ignite session. We do have the Dell hardware in the back of the room. You heard me talk about the 930. There's also, I believe, the R830. So if you want to take a look at the hardware and see what it looks like on the inside, we've cracked the covers, and you feel welcome to take a look at it. Okay? All right, thanks to all of you.